Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Kevin Garricky. I am the faculty advisor for Phi Theta Kappa, the Honor Society at West Kentucky Community and Technical College. And I welcome each and every one of you here uh, for an exciting and, and interesting uh, afternoon uh, discussion. We have uh, some gentlemen here who will uh, present a debate. And I was reading the other day about debates in Native American culture in American colonial times. And the purpose of the debates was to educate and enlighten, um, as opposed to the British Parliament at that time, in which the purpose of the debate was to shout louder than the other person. Um, and our purpose here today is to have a debate uh, in which we will be educated and enlightened uh, about two different perspectives, that of creationism, that of evolution. And uh, this is what's becoming a series for Phi Theta Kappa. We hosted a debate in the fall, and again this semester, and hopefully this will just continue to be a regular debate series sponsored by Phi Theta Kappa. But we do welcome each and every one of you here. To introduce our speakers, uh, I, I will uh, have uh, the president of Phi Theta Kappa, Cole Hackett, come up. He will introduce the speakers and explain um, how the debate will operate, um, who will do what. So thank you very much. Thank you again for being here. Uh, like you said, my name is Cole Hackett. I'm the president of Phi Theta Kappa here at WKCTC. Uh, today we have Dr. Jay Weil, creationist, and Dr. Robert Martin, who is an evolutionist. Uh, Dr. Weil, uh, excuse me, Dr. Martin won the coin toss, so Dr. Weil would be going first. So I'll introduce him first to you. Dr. Jay Weil holds an earned PhD from the University of Rochester in nuclear chemistry and a BS, B, a BS in chemistry from the same institution. He has taught at both the university and high school levels and has won several awards for excellence in teaching and research. He has also published more than 30 articles in nationally recognized peer-reviewed journals and has nine books to his credit, including Reasonable Faith, The Scientific Case for Christianity. Dr. Weil's teaching credits include the University of Rochester, Indiana University, Ball State University, and the Indiana Academy for Science, Mathematics, and Humanity. Currently, he writes for Apologia Educational Ministries, a company dedicated to giving uh, people scientific reasons to believe in Christ. The company's specialty is science curriculum for home educated students. Dr. Robert Martin holds a BA uh, from Hofstra, Hofstra University, an MS from Tulane University, and a PhD from University of Florida. He is a professor in the biology department at Murray State University and he teaches courses in evolution and ecology. His primary research is in mammalian paleobiology including the evolution of small mammal communities and the systematics and evolution of rodents. Dr. Martin has done field work in the Mead Basin of southwestern Kansas and the Baza Basin of southeastern Spain. His work has most recently been supported by the National Geographic Society and the National Science Foundation. He has also published more than 60 peer-reviewed papers. Please join me in welcoming both scientists. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you know what the rules are for the debate. Dr. Weil will be giving his presentation first, followed by Dr. Mar Martin's presentation. Then there will be five minute rebuttals to each presentation. So uh, Dr. Weil will give his rebuttal to Dr. Uh, Martin's presentation first. Then Dr. Martin will give his rebuttal in which he can only refer to Dr. Weil's presentation. He cannot rebut Dr. Weil's rebuttal at all. Then there will be five minute rebuttals to the rebuttals in which <laughs> they must refer to each other's rebuttals, not the rebuttal to the rebuttal. <laughs> so hopefully that will all work itself out through the debate. So Dr. Martin, when you're, or Dr. Weil, when you're ready. 
Thank you very much for coming. I'd like to thank Dr. Martin for coming. You're actually witnessing a fairly rare event in academia, and that's open discussion of real issues. And I'd like to thank Dr. Martin for being a part of that. I'm supposed to give you the evidence that I see for creation. When I look at a scientific uh, model, what I want it to do is make useful predictions, and I want those predictions to be backed up by the data. And I see that in the creation model. For example, the first uh, prediction of the creation model that I uh, think is most intriguing is the creation model predicts amazing design in nature. The creator, whatever it was, is pretty smart. And so you would expect, if you look at nature, you would find things that would put human technology to shame. And in fact, that's exactly what you see. Unfortunately, these guys are kind of uh, white, <laughs> kind of uh, washed out here. But there are pits that are going all along the mouth and the snout and so forth of this shark. Those pits hold the ampullae of Lorenzini. These ampullae of Lorenzini are essentially electrical field sensors. They sense the electrical fields coming from muscle movements in the creatures underwater. The shark senses those electrical fields from all the creatures, filters out any electrical fields it's not interested in, concentrates only on the electrical fields of the things it can eat. It then pinpoints the precise location of that electrical field in three-dimensional space and goes and eats the prey. It doesn't have to see, smell, or otherwise sense the prey. All it has to do is look at the electrical fields. Now these ampullae of Lorenzini are so well designed that they have a sensitivity of up to five billionths of a volt per centimeter. There's no three-dimensional electrical field sensor made by human technology that comes anywhere close to that. But if you want to see where the real design in nature comes from, you look at cases where organisms have been made to work together so that they each survive. This is called mutualism and it's abundant throughout nature. A great example comes from the chromatogaster ants and the acacia trees. These trees have hollow thorns and they produce nectar that the tree doesn't use in any way. However, the ants live in the thorns and eat the nectar. In response, the ants will viciously attack anything that tries to eat the tree. An insect comes and lands on the leaves, they attack it. Even a large herbivore like a giraffe, if it tries to eat the tree, the ants will swarm it to try and get it off. Now this system works great, but there is one time in the year when the tree would like to have some insects visit it, and that's when it's flowering. Because some insects help in pollen transfer, which is a sexual reproduction mode among angiosperms. So for the acacia tree to allow this to happen, as its blooms are forming, the blooms produce ant repellent. Not general insect repellent, but ant repellent that keeps the ants away from the, from the blooms, but keeps them on the rest of the tree. So pollinators are focused to the uh, blooms because that's the only place that's safe for them to land. Now this is an incredibly well-designed system. And to give you an idea of how well-designed it is, Palmer and his associates decided they would help the acacia trees a little bit. What they decided was these poor little ants just aren't very good at repelling large herbivores like giraffes. So what they did was they fenced in a bunch of acacia trees, thinking that protection from the large herbivores would help the acacia trees grow. Turns out it made them all sicker. Because without the pressure from the large herbivores, the tree stopped devoting as many resources to the ants, and a lot of the ants got annoyed and left. And as a result, it opened the tree up for insect predation. Now this is very much like a person who doesn't know much about an engine trying to fix an engine. You know, if you don't know what you're doing, the engine is so well designed that you're more likely to do any harm than you are good. In the same way, Palmer and his associates tried to tinker with a well-designed system, and they ended up doing more harm to the system than good. So you see a lot of amazing design in nature, uh, and I think that's a direct uh, prediction of the creation model. Creation model lots, makes a lot of other predictions, however. One of the more classic ones is that vestigial organis, organs should be fairly rare. Um, Darwin thought, saw a lot of organs in different uh, creatures that he thought were, were useless. And he actually likened them to the silent letters in a word. He said, just like the silent letters in a word aren't pronounced, but they give you some idea of the word's origin, in the same way, there are certain organs in the body, vestigial organs, that aren't used, but give you an idea of the origin of the organism involved. And in fact, this was such a pervasive thought at the time that in 1893, a well-known anatomist um, made a list of 83 vestigial organs that exist in humans. 
Now, the specific prediction of the creation model is that none of those 83 vestigial organs would be uh, really vestigial, and so the creationists predicted we would find uh, uh, uses for all these supposed vestigial organs. The larger prediction is that, in general, organs were made for the organism. Unless you can find a distinct case where use of the organ doesn't matter, you don't expect to find vestigial organs. You might find vestigial organs, say, in fish that live in caves. They don't need to use their eyes anymore because there's no light down there, so the eyes could go, uh, go useless. But in general, vestigial organs should be the exception, not the rule. And specifically, these 83 organs would be found to have purposes. And in fact, they have. In fact, of all the organs in the human body, there's only one possible vestigial organ left, and that's the male nipple. That's it. Even the appendix, which many biology and anatomy books still incorrectly say is non-functional, has a demonstrated necessary function in terms of supporting the flora in the intestine, in a healthy intestine anyway. So once again, the creation model is the prediction that comes out to be correct here. In a very similar but more updated uh, situation, the creation model prediction is there's very little or no junk DNA. The term junk DNA was actually coined by a geneticist by the name of Ono. He was actually looking at sections of a genome that he couldn't discern a function for. So he called it junk DNA. He didn't think it had a function. In fact, he likened it to fossils. He said, you know, there are a lot of useless fossils strewn about the Earth, and they tell us about Earth's history. It makes sense then that there would be useless sections of DNA scattered among the genomes indicating the history of that genome. And in fact, the idea of junk DNA was so prevalent for a while that when the Human Genome Project was announced, a lot of people said, don't bother to sequence the junk. As this uh, reporter from Science News says, at one time people said, why even bother to sequence the whole genome? Why not just sequence the protein coding part? Now, the protein coding part of the human genome represents 3% of the genome. It was actually thought at one time that 97% of the genome was junk. Well, it turns out that a large fraction of the supposed junk DNA we found functions for, in fact, what Ono was looking at, we now call pseudogenes, and we know their function, they have regulatory functions and so forth. But to get an idea of just how much of the a human genome is functional, all you have to do is look at the results of a project called ENCODE. Project ENCODE is looking at how, how much of the human genome is actually transcribed by the cell. Transcription is the first part of protein synthesis, and it requires a lot of resources and a lot of energy. Project ENCODE's argument is, if the genes were, if, or if the part of the genome wasn't functional, it wouldn't be transcribed, because why would the cell waste so much energy and resources? So their view is, anything that's transcribed is functional. Now, they've only looked at a small fraction of the human genome, but in fact, of that fraction, 93% of it is transcribed. So even though we don't know the functions, it's assumed that at least 93% of the genome is functional because the cell devotes an enormous amount of energy and resources into transcribing it. That's a direct prediction of the creation model, confirmed. Another prediction of the creation model is that mutations should erode genetic information, not enhance it. Um, if we're, going to get, if we're going to get from some single-celled creature all the way up to multi-celled creatures, all the way up to vertebrates, all the way up to man, we're going to have to add a lot to a genome. Now, the driving force in evolution for that is mutations. But mutations in the creationist view should only harm the genome because, after all, in the creationist view, the genome is a highly structured, very ordered set of information. Random changes to ordered information doesn't produce good new information. And in fact, study after study after study shows this to be true. An interesting person to talk to about this is J.C. Sanford, Cornell University professor. He holds 25 patents in genetics, including one of the first methods by which we could change an organism's genome. He knows a little bit about genetics. He was focused on plants. Here's what he says. For several decades, this was the main thrust of crop improvement research. Vast numbers of mutants were produced and screened, collectively representing many billions of mutation events. The idea here is, if we want to produce better crops, let's do it the way evolution does it. Let's mutate the heck out of them, and hopefully something good will come out. And a lot of times a lot of trash will come out, but hopefully something good will come out and we can exploit it. The effort, for the most part, was an enormous failure. Low phytate corn is the most notable example of successful mutating, mut mutation breeding. 
Turns out low phytate corn is useful in some kinds of uh, animal feeds, so it can be useful. The low phytate corn was created by mutagenizing corn and then selecting for strains wherein the genetic machinery, which directs phytic acid production, had been damaged. In other words, after decades of work and billions of mutational events, the best we could come up with was a plant whose genome had been deteriorated. Now, it had been deteriorated in a way that we could use it, but still it was deteriorated. Nothing new, no new information was added. Now, if you've been incorrectly informed that the bacterial resistance to antibiotics that we're seeing is the result of mutations adding to the genome, uh, we need to clear that up right now. The vast majority of antibacterial resist or antibiotic resistance doesn't come by mutation at all. It comes from transformation, transduction, and conjugation, which are means by which bacteria swap around existing genes. So none of that in involves new genes. In the few cases where mutations do cause resistance, it's do done by a loss of function. An example of this is anthrax. Cipro is a common antibiotic used against anthrax. It works because the Cipro can bind to an enzyme in the anthrax called DNA gyrase, and this stops the uh, bacterium from being able to reproduce, which eventually kills the population. Well, in the end, some mutant anthrax have such damaged DNA gyrase that Cipro can't bind to it anymore. So in the end, Cipro can't stop the function. However, this enzyme isn't better, it's actually degraded. It's degraded so much that its efficiency is significantly lower than the wild type enzyme, such that bacterial reproduction is incredibly slowed. So in the end, in the presence of Cipro, incredibly slow reproduction is better than no reproduction at all. But the fact is, the reason these guys can, are resistant to Cipro is because they lost function, not because they gained function as a result of mutation. That's what we see mutation doing, losing function, not gaining function. Another prediction of the creation model has to do with the fossil record. The creation event should have been discontinuous. The creator created this kind of organism, that kind of organism, that kind of organism. Now, in each organism, the genome has some flexibility to allow the organism to adapt to its changing surroundings and so forth. But in the end, you should expect the fossil record to be a reflection of the creation event, and so as a result should be discontinuous. And in fact, that's what we see in the fossil record. By and large, the fossil record is incredibly discontinuous. Here are a couple fellows, uh, uh, evolutionists, who will tell us about that. Ernst Mayer says, wherever we look at the living biota, discontinuities are overwhelmingly frequent. So that's the living biota. The discontinuities are even more striking in the fossil record. New species usually appear in the fossil record suddenly. E.V. Koonin says, major transitions in the biological evolution show sudden emergence of diverse forms at a new level of complexity. In each of these pivotal nexuses in life's history, the principal types seem to appear rapidly and fully equipped with the signature features of the respecting new level of biological organization. Now, please understand, these guys aren't admitting to the discontinuities in the fossil record and saying, as a result, I don't believe in evolution. Now, both Mayer and Koonin have their own flavors of evolution. Mayer did the fundamental theoretical groundwork that Gould and Eldritch picked up and formed punctuated equilibrium, which is one flavor of evolution that explains around the fact that the fossil record is incredibly discontinuous. Eugene Koonin believes in Hox genes as the major transformative uh, f uh, factor in evolution, which has to do with embryonic development. That would also expect to, to lead to very rapid evolutionary uh, 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 transitions. So in the end, both of them are pointing out the discontinuity in the fossil record because their flavor of evolution explains around those discontinuities. Now, I have no problem with that. If you form a hypothesis, you look at the data, and the hypothesis doesn't square exactly with the data, it's OK to come up with ad hoc reasons as to why the data don't look the way you want. And that's a legitimate thing. It's done in science all of the time. Uh, however, the creation model predicted the discontinuity. It didn't have to explain around it. And in my view, any model that predicts a feature of the data is superior to a model that has to explain around it. Now, you know, of course, I'm giving you the procreation stuff, so I'm not going to talk about the things the creationists have to explain around. They're certainly there. But nevertheless, I think the creation model has made a solid prediction about the fossil record that overall has come true. Now, how much time do I have? Three minutes? I can go through this. Um, another issue that uh, young earth creationists, this is specifically young earth creation, which is only one flavor of creation, 
predicted quite some time ago is that layers of sediment can be laid down simultaneously so as to form sedimentary rock with many layers that formed very, very rapidly. Now, the first time this was seen was actually in experiments by Berthold, uh, and it was published in the peer-reviewed Creationist Journal in 1988. And he showed in laboratory experiments that whether you used air, still water, or running water to deposit sediments, you could form layers in those sediments. It took nine years for the evolutionary journal Nature to catch up to the creationists. It took them nine years to finally do very similar studies, interestingly enough, never re referencing the creationists who were the first ones to do it, to show that yes, this does indeed happen. Set layers of sediment can be laid down simultaneously. We also see that in the field. This is a picture of a wall of sediments that's in the middle of lithophyte. This wall of sediments is clearly at least 10 feet high, depending on how big this uh, woman is here. Uh, and you see it's stratified. This is sedimentary rock. It was laid down by a mud flow as a result of the Mount St. Helens catastrophe. It formed in five hours. This wall of, of sediment wasn't there. Five hours later, this stratified wall of sediment was there. Now, creationists predicted for a long time that we would find processes by which stratified sediment could be laid down simultaneously. And in fact, between the experiments of Bertholdt and the field studies at Mount St. Helens, we're at least seeing that that's happening. Now, I had a few more. I didn't think I could possibly get through all of them, even though I can talk pretty quickly when I want to. But in the end, I do think the creation model makes not only useful predictions about nature, but predictions that have been, by and large, confirmed by the data. So I consider it a reasonable scientific theory. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weil, or uh, Dr. Robert Martin will now give a 15 minute presentation as well. how this thing works. This a little forward, a little back. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for inviting uh, me here to participate, and Dr. Wild for also for his participation. Um, this is uh, the title to a book that I published on uh, uh, the subject of evolution. It includes um, a uh, uh, section on general evolutionary principles and transitions in the fossil record at all uh, geographic and chronological scales. All right, well, let's, let's set the scene here. Um, we have a controversy uh, between two models of how the world works. We can simplify it into two basic ideas or hypotheses. Uh, the universe and the Earth is young, and the universe and everything was created by a deity, or the universe and, and Earth are billions of years old, and organisms on Earth, including humans, uh, share a single long genealogy or family tree, just like your family tree, a pattern of ancestry and descent. Now, clearly, both of these ideas can't be right. The Earth is either old or it's not. Um, organisms, including humans, either evolved or they did not. There's really no intermediate position in this particular form of the argument. Now, however, one, one can uh, 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 not test certain ideas. For example, there is a God, there is not a God. Uh, what happened before the birth of the universe? These are ideas, but they are currently untestable, and consequently they are out of the purview of science or anything that, that I do. They form part of a person's belief system, but they cannot be tested. However, there are certain ideas or hypotheses that do flow from the major uh, hypotheses that, that are uh, I presented, and Dr. Weil actually has talked about a couple of these. For example, the Earth is old, the Earth is young. Um, intermediate forms are found in the fossil record, uh, or they're not. Um, there are no contradictions in the fossil record, but according to the particularly the young Earth creationist model, those contradictions, contradictions must exist. That is, dinosaurs and humans must have been contemporaneous, because there just isn't that much time um, for them to be separate talking less than 10,000 years. Um, finally, humans are very closely related to primates and less closely related to organisms, other organisms, and that indicates a genetic evolutionary continuity 
or there's no special relationship between humans and primates because humans were created uh, de novo. All right, now let's start out with, with dating. With regard to dating fossils, we have put a rover on Mars, which takes an incredible amount of technology. So how difficult do you think it is to date a rock? No matter what you hear or think or read, this is not difficult stuff, folks. It does require some relatively sophisticated machinery, but the methods have been well developed for many, many years. There's simply no doubt about ages of things anymore within reason. Um, it's relatively easy. It's a relatively accurate method. Um, and today, believing that the Earth is less than 10,000 year old, years old is exactly the same as believing it's flat when we know it's round. A, um, uh, a colleague of mine at another school who was a pastor and a very religious individual wrote a paper for his theological work called Boundaries of Belief. There are certain things that even he said that you just cannot accept these days, and one of them is, is the young earth. If you do, you put yourself in a very, very tiny minority, almost a, a, a clan, and you're only going to be able to communicate with other people of that ilk, and you don't want to be that ostracized from the mass of educated, the educated world. All right, so uh, from a number of sources, we know the Earth is uh, about 4.5 billion years old. Uh, here are some Australian fossils that are dated to about 3.6 billion years. Um, there are new fossils that are found almost every day that reveal secrets of life's history. Here, for example, is a reconstruction of one of the earliest chordates uh, from the famous Burgess Shale of uh, British Columbia, dated to about 570 million years ago. But this isn't the only place these things are found. There are these new and wonderful and spectacular deposits in China that are about the same age, that have even a larger diversity of early chordates. And of course, we are chordates, so we're talking about here possibly um, representatives of some of our own ancestry. Um, here is Archaeopteryx. Most of you, I'm sure, have heard of this. Probably the most famous fossil in the world. There are about seven or eight specimens known. They're kept under lock and key in a German bank vault. Um, this is a, what some people could, I think, legitimately call a kind of an intermediate or missing link between major groups, in this case, reptiles and birds. It has a long, uh, bony tail. It's got uh, teeth. It's got uh, uh, free digits with claws and a variety of other features that show its intermediate position between birds and reptiles. Uh, there are many feathered dinosaurs now known. Um, these have been, again, come out, these have come out of these, these wonderful deposits in southern China. We have the imprints of the feathers um, as well. And there is no evidence, none, zero, for any kind of contemporaneity of any of these ancient animals with humans. Uh, maybe even Velociraptor was feathered, and the reason that's suggested is that current very sophisticated uh, analyses of characteristics have shown that most of Velociraptor's um, relatives were feathered. We have the imprints from them, so maybe Velociraptor was feathered too. Um, lots of toothy birds are known, not just Archaeopteryx. There are hundreds of them from all over the world where, that are even more modern than Archaeopteryx and found much more towards recent time, the Cretaceous, for example, um, where the, the tailbone is reduced and the birds look much more modern, but they've got, they've got reptilian teeth and other reptilian features, but they fly around. So what happened to the dinosaurs then? You've probably heard of some of the scenarios, but there's actually a lot of physical evidence for an asteroid impact that occurred about 65 to 67 million years ago that wiped out many of the ecosystems in a nuclear winter scenario, blocking out the sun and cooling the earth for a long period of time. And it wasn't just dinosaurs that went extinct, by the way. It was a lot of marine organisms as well. And um, one of the bits of evidence is, is that there's actually a crater um, off of the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula that may in fact represent, well, it has been dated exactly to this time period and may actually be the smoking gun. Um, now, to switch uh, directions a little bit, creationists argue that intricate and complex organs and organisms cannot have evolved. They must have been created by, uh, by God. 
Um, this is called by creationists the principle of irreducible complexity, an often cited example of which is the human eye. And you can use this as a metaphor for, for many of the other things, including some of the things that have been mentioned. But um, many intermediate eye configurations are known among living organisms. We don't just have, boom, this very uh, uh, elaborate eye with nothing in between. Almost all of them, from simple eye spots to little cups that are photoreceptors and everything up to and including human eyes are, are well known. And that's just among living organisms, which are not promoted uh, by me or anyone else as the uh, ancestor descendants of uh, leading to the modern eye of humans, but they give you a very good example of how these things could have evolved. Uh, and by the way, complex eyes, just like ours, or even more complex, are not limited to humans. This, for example, on the bottom is, um, well, this just doesn't seem to be working. Anyway, is a squid eye in comparison to a human eye, equally complex. And there are many other examples uh, of that. We're not the only ones with complex organ systems. So this, what this boils down to, this design argument, is um, basically a proposition that I cannot conceive of, that is the person who's doing the conceiving, and you, p you fill in the blank, of something evolving. Therefore, it must have been created by the deity. This doesn't logically follow, nor is there any evidence that it is true. And basically, it's an argument more from ignorance than anything else. And there's nothing wrong with ignorance. I'm not talking about stupidity here. I mean, we're all ignorant. We're all trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And uh, I just have a different explanation for that. But certainly, the idea that simply because you can't explain, you, for that matter, how something might have evolved, that means it didn't. That's not even legal in terms of an argument. So now, humans have family trees. You all have them. Right? You can follow yours back to a certain point in time, and then it probably disappears because the records have been destroyed or something. But you know that it doesn't end there. Why should it end there? It, it doesn't. It goes back basically forever. And there's no reason that it, it doesn't. And there's no evidence for any kind of special creation of any species at any particular point in time. Now, switching back to the fossil record, talking about transitional forms one of the predictions of, our, of the evolutionary model is that you will find transitional forms. Not every single animal that's ever existed, my goodness. That's a, a, an absurd expectation. We are so fortunate that we have any sediments left on Earth because erosion's working all the time. The fact that we have so much, though, is uh, a testimony to the, the uh, field work of paleontologists all over the world and the fact that we do have quite enough to determine that things have changed. All right, so for example, we have, we have whales. It's a wonderful story that's just kind of developed in the last 50 years as more fossil specimens have uh, come about. And we have a documentation of the transition of early terrestrial artiodactyls to aquatic proto-whales and then onward. Now I want to point out this mesonicid or artiodactyl thing. This is an animal that existed maybe 60 million years ago, that, no, 50, about 55 million years ago, that had little hooves on its feet instead of claws. And that's the kind of animal, though it might have looked like a uh, kind of a blunt-nosed uh, wolf, that gave rise to the hooved animals. All right, here's a wonderful creature, a reconstruction of Ambulocetus, that we, we can call it a crocodile in terms of its, its, act, um, its activities, but basically it's a whale. All of the characteristics of the skull show it's a proto-whale but it just happens to be in this intermediate semi-aquatic uh, condition. But it had tiny hooves on its feet. More advanced fossil whales, some with these vestigial or reduced pelvic girdles are also known. The uh, hominid pedigree has become very interesting, much richer, uh, lots of fossils now, some dating from six to seven million years ago near the ape human transition. Uh, and then these other things coming up that have an unexpected mosaic of flat face or advanced features and some primitive features. And it turns out that there's no difference really here in terms of what's going on in the human pedigree with almost all the other uh, groups that we know from the fossil record. When you get a novel innovation, something that's working, you get this explosion and this rapid combination of features leading 
um, to a, a number of different species, all kind of trying to be human at the same time. So there's lots of fossils supporting this record. We share about 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees. Our skeletons are more similar to those of other primates than to other animals. So how can these similarities be explained other than by close genetic and evolutionary relationship? And so the summary of all of the data s certainly supports a uh, fossil record and a, a human evolution. In summary for evolution, mutations in DNA create genetic variation. Ma natural forces act on that, predation, competition, temperatures. They weed out within individuals those that are not fit. Some species over time go extinct, whole species, just like individuals, and are replaced by others. Over long periods of time, gradual transformation is observed in the fossil record. And here we have almost a perfect uh, fossil record showing changes in the jaw and skull structures going from ancient reptiles to modern uh, type mammals. Um, there's a nice reconstruction on the right. We are derived, mammals are derived from ancient uh, mammal-like reptiles that were uh, carnivorous. Now, in summary, we're, we're not anti-religion, we're not anti-God. We can't explain the evolution of the universe, the origin of it, excuse me. We can't explain why there's something instead of nothing. And this allows for room for spirituality in, in, in whatever form suits a particular individual. Um, but let's assume that evolution did occur. Would this not be as miraculous as special creation? And after all, if you believe in God, and if humans evolved, then that's how the deity planned it. Right? And then this quote I, I just had to include from um, the Bible. I, I'm not a biblical scholar, but this has always impressed me, to know the truth. And I think that's what we're all after. We want to know the truth. And then finally, evolution probably is not as stately as gradual as Darwin once viewed it. There are punctuations, and things don't come about in this stately single generation change through through time. But nevertheless, Darwin said it best. Whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Thank you. Dr. Wow will now have five minutes to rebut Dr. Martin's presentation. If you could find the uh, uh, PowerPoint that says whale evolution, that'd be a good one to point out, put up. I, I want to start by saying I think, uh, you know, as, as good as Dr. Martin's presentation was, I think he mischaracterized a few things that I want to clear up. Creation as an idea was mischaracterized. It isn't the earth is very young uh, or the earth is very old. Uh, one of my favorite people to talk to is Hugh Ross. He is a creationist who believes the earth is billions of years old. Uh, he believes that God created in lots of little events that were stretched over billions of years. So it's kind of uh, a mischaracterization to say that you have to choose one flavor of uh, 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 creationism, young earth creation, or one flavor of evolution. There are all sorts of things in between. Uh, also, I think it's a rather uh, uh, incongruous statement to say we've put a rover on Mars. How difficult can it be to uh, date rocks? We've put a rover on Mars, how difficult can it be to cure the common cold? Uh, the fact is, our technology is limited and our ability to interpret data are limited. For example, in all these radioactive dating techniques that are used, it is assumed radioactive half-lives stay constant. But we know that's not true. In fact, we, we've seen uh, several different labs now say that the radioactive ha half-lives of isotopes actually vary with the distance from the sun to the moon, or sun to the earth, sorry. Uh, and they can actually see the periodic changes in the, in the half-life due to the infinitesimal change between the distance to the sun and the distance to the earth. So clearly we don't understand radioactivity as well as we think we do, so to try and use that for dating, not very reliable. I do have to clear up a couple of mistakes he made as well. He says that we share 99% of our genome with the chimp. That is false. Uh, uh, for example, first of all, the chimp genome hasn't been fully sequenced, so it's speculation at best. Of the chimp genome that's been sequenced, the current numbers are, if you include in, in, insertions and deletions called indels, we are only 95% similar to chimps, not 98 or 99. And in fact, the major histocompatibility complex of the uh, uh, chimp was fully sequenced. And when we compare that to the human, the number drops to 86.7%. 
So in fact, we are not as close to the chimps genetically as evolutionists want you to believe. Um, and so, so I think it's important to clear that up. Uh, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about the whale evolution at, at this point because I think it talks a little bit about how we can read into the fossils what's not there. Initially, one of the uh, preliminary uh, uh, proto-whales he showed was Pachycetus. It was originally found only as parts of a skull, and as a result, the reconstruction shown down here was made. And that was actually put on the cover of Science and so forth. It turns out when a much clean, a fuller skeleton of Pachycetus was found, a much more reasonable construction was made. And you can see that they are not the same at all. Now this fossil was found in, in 2001, and I find it interesting that in his book, on copyright in 2004, Dr. Martin uses this reconstruction, not the more correct one. Um, but looking specifically at the uh, hind limbs, which is what are supposed to show this wonderful tale of whale evolution, boy, this just doesn't look very good, does it? Ouch. Um, in any event, uh, you can't see this guy real well, but you can see these three guys fairly well. Uh, we get to Pachycetus, he you know, looked like we showed you here, uh, so that's uh, uh, not very whale-like. We get to Rhodocetus, we see lots of large hind limbs and so forth, and we see nares or uh, nostrils that are very close to the front of the stout. Then we get to the first sort of whale-like thing, and you see we go from nice to find hind limbs here to these little uh, bones down here. Now, Dr. Martin would like to call these vestigial hind limbs, but they're not vestigial. In fact, they serve a very important purpose, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but you don't see any real transition here. All you see is we go from fully formed limbs to these bones that only have something in common with hind limbs. Notice as well that the nares are still near the front. When we get to the real whale, the, the equivalent of the nail of the blowhole blow, blow is way up on the top, instituting a completely different type of respiration. So I don't see any real commonalities here. I see uh, uh, you know, uh, creatures that all fit their ecosystems and so forth, but I don't see a lot of transition or commonalities. Now talking specifically about these uh, hind limbs, these are supposed to be vestigial. They are not. As a fact, in evolution of whales, it's noted that they act as an anchor for the muscles of the genitalia. What they do is they actually support and protect the genitalia. They have to be there or the creatures can't reproduce. That doesn't make them vestigial. And in fact, if you look at the bones between males and females, they're different. That also indicates that they're truly functional. If they were vestiges, they wouldn't be different because they don't show a human or a reproductive function anymore. And in fact, if you look at the embryonic development, they're formed purposefully. They start off as buds from the, uh, uh, from the skeleton, and then when they get to the point where they need to be, the original buds deteriorate away, so you only have the bones that are necessary there anymore. So these aren't you know, vestigial and they aren't some remnant of some evolutionary past. They're actually very important uh, bones that are a part of the whale. There aren't any, there aren't any vestigial remains there. Um, I, I find it interesting that Dr. Martin was talking about uh, the evolution of feathers in birds and how this is very well documented. Because in fact, uh, according to at least one very well-known expert in ornithology, this is not true. Alan Fiducia is the fellow who told us what Archaeopteryx did. He was the fellow who told us that Archaeopteryx was a strong flyer. When everybody else wanted to put Archaeopteryx on the ground, Fiducia showed quite clearly that he was a strong flyer and so forth. He says that this idea that we're finding fossils of feathers on dinosaurs is a witness of the meltdown of modern paleontology. He shows quite convincingly that what these folks are saying are protofeathers are actually collagen fibers, fossils of collagen fibers, which are simply part of the skin. They have nothing to do with feathers, and he, calls, he says calling them feathers is an indication of the meltdown of, of paleontology. Thank you. Dr. Mal, uh, Dr. Martin will have five minutes to rebut Dr. Wiles' presentation. He cannot refer to Dr. Wiles' rebuttal at all. Just as a reminder, we do have pieces of paper, so if you have any questions, write them down and, and send them down here to Dr. Gerke. This must seem very difficult to you. You're all hearing so much stuff, none of which you probably know a darn thing about. <laughs> and so you sit there saying, well, does he know his stuff? Does he know his stuff? I don't know how to answer that. I guess you'll have to do some reading on your own. And it's very frustrating, probably for both of us, because we have answers to each other's um, uh, responses. 
Um, for example, shark pits, the ampullae of Lorenzini. I teach this stuff in my anatomy and evolution classes, and they're wonderful things, exactly like uh, Dr. Weil uh, presented, but they're derivatives of the lateral line system, very specialized electroreceptors, which are not also um, uh, limited just to sharks. They're found in a number of aquatic vertebrates. But just again, because they look wonderful, does not, by definition, mean they must have been produced de novo by, by God and that they can't have evolved. It just means that we have to be a little bit smarter and have more information and try to figure it out. Um, the Anacacia system is an example of what we call coevolution. I teach that also in my ecology class, um, discovered in, and, and described by uh, Daniel Jansen. It's a wonderfully uh, interesting and mutually satisfactory relationship between the acacia plant and, and the ants that live on them. And uh, they even clear the area around the, 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 the plant so that sunlight can get in. It's a great thing. Um, but once again, not understanding how it could evolve doesn't mean it didn't evolve. And we explain that as a classic example of coevolution, whereby um, the selective value of these behaviors um, are so obvious that through time, those uh, animals that have those genetic propensities to protect the acacia are obviously going to be selected for, and the ones that are not are going to go extinct. It's actually a very simple thing to explain, though we don't have a fossil record for it. So you have to kind of decide yourself which one sounds most reasonable. Um, vestigial organs. It's, a, it, it's an interesting and ingenious way to explain away something that is, in fact, mostly the result of, of, of evolution. They're basically leftovers of evolution. Now, the one point I want to make, just because it has a reduced function from when it first appeared, all right, uh, or has a, excuse me, has a new function, somewhat new function from what it was when it first appeared, doesn't mean it didn't uh, reduce over time and become vestigial for that original function. For example, your coccyx, all right? I mean, this result, this was a reduction from tail bones. I mean, this is very clear. It may have a function in protecting you now when you fall down and other functions, but nevertheless, it is a vestigial structure. Likewise, in whales, for example, it's been known for many, many years that whales have these, uh, are occasionally found some with the extensions of these uh, uh, rudimentary hind limbs that have no function whatsoever in sperm whales, for example, um, that uh, are, are clearly vestigial uh, structures from the ancient uh, terrestrial and, uh, ancestry. Why would they have the actual bones? I mean, you can see them, the femur, the, uh, the, the tibia, fibula, pieces, uh, pieces of the old phalanges, they're there. Uh, would they have some other function? Po possibly. In some of the whales I'm talking about, they don't. In a couple others, they may support the genital area, muscles to some extent, but uh, they still are vestigial from ancient whale uh, ancestors. Junk DNA? There's tons of junk DNA. There's, um, you get so much, you have so much DNA uh, that is unfunctional, that probably has accumulated through millions of years from viral infections. You know, think about something like herpes. You know, basically herpes or, um, uh, in insinuates its uh, RNA into your system and you have it forever, right? Well, just try to multiply that over uh, hundreds of millions of years. You have a tremendous amount of stuff that you've gotten from extraneous sorts that in fact has no function. One of my colleagues studies this stuff. Um, mute, uh, mutations should harm the organism. Well, uh, most mutations are simple little point mutations. They may have no uh, uh, effect on you whatsoever. Every generation, every gene mutates to some extent. We know this. It just happens. In, in most of the cases, they're single point mutations, meaning a single nucleotide substitution, and it has no function. Sometimes that will have a, a function or potentially could have one. And there are many lethal uh, mutations known. No question about that. But then again, what's the, what are the probabilities we're talking about over millions and billions of years? Um, we have now dis discovered these things called Hox genes. These are conserved genes which all organisms have. Fruit flies have them. 
and we have them. They're not just similar genes, they're the same genes. They are responsible for basic patterns of symmetry. And we know that simple changes in those can cause um, uh, proportional changes and change organisms fairly dramatically. That might, in fact, be um, quite uh, uh, satisfactory under the given circumstances. There's a flightless cormorant on the Galapagos Islands that has tiny little buds of wings that's obviously a mutation. But it can survive there. It has no predators. It's a diving bird. It eats fish. It does just fine. There's a naked mole rat. Has no, uh, it's the only native occurring uh, naked mammal. It's a, it's a burrowing mammal in uh, northern Africa. Clearly, it's a mutation, all or nothing, no fur. It's created in the laboratory all the time by accident through mutations. But this one can survive because it's an underground animal where it's cooler. You put it in the sun, it dies in half an hour. There are many, many examples of these things these things. Some are, are lethal, some are not. The fossil record predicts con discontinuity, excuse me, the, the, the uh, creationist model cr predicts discontinuity in the fossil record. I mentioned before, we have, we are so fortunate to have such a terrific fossil record in which there are no contributions. And you can see many uh, uh, transitional forms in many groups. Um, I can't talk about whales right now, I will later. But, um, in any case, they're there. There's lots of them. And the main thing is that it's all consistent. We don't have everything, but we're very fortunate because we have a lot, and it all supports the evolutionary model. I guess that's about it. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Weil will have, now have a five minute rebuttal to the rebuttal. I absolutely agree with Dr. Martin. The way to find out who's telling you the truth here is do some reading on your own. I was an evolutionist until I started looking into evolution. That's when I left evolution. So yeah, you can take his word, you can take my word. Neither one of us are worth what a lot of study on your own will give you. Um, please understand the argument from design is not, uh, I can't imagine how it could have evolved, therefore it didn't argument. It's a recognition that when we see design elements, we know designer. For example, right now, according to the way we figure out where humans uh, have been in the past, we generally don't look for human remains. We look for the remains of their tools. We find a little sharpened piece of flint that can be held in the hand, and we say, this obviously had a designer. And this tells me there was humans here. I don't need their bones to find out they were here because I saw something they designed. This is classic science. When you see something that looks designed, the best inference is there was a designer. It's not a, I can't imagine how it evolved. It's a recognition of the fact that design generally requires a designer. Um, um, he talked about bones growing out of sperm whales. Uh, those are not remnants from legs. Those are, in fact, mutants of the important genitalia bones that I talked about earlier. And I find it really interesting that he says there's an enormous amount in the genome that we can't imagine what its function is. Therefore, it must be functionless. Yet he doesn't like what he characterized creation as saying, I can't imagine how it evolved, therefore it didn't. The fact that we can't imagine a function for a section of our genome doesn't mean a function doesn't exist. We couldn't imagine the function of pseudogenes in 1972. We now know their function. They serve as regulatory agents. What Dr. Martin wants you to believe is that the cell devotes an enormous amount of energy and resources to transcribing useless DNA. If he says most of our uh, genome is useless, what he's saying is each one of our cells devotes huge amounts of energy and resources to describing or to transcribing useless DNA. That makes no sense. It's a more reasonable conclusion to think that that, ge those, that portion of the genome has functionality, just not functionality we can gather yet. And that's a very, very important distinction. Now, Dr. Martin wants, wants you to say that, wants you to, uh, to ignore the fact that when we do millions and billions of mutation events in the lab, we never improve the genome of the creature. He wants you to ignore that. He wants you to hope that there are a few unlikely mutations that actually can add to the genome of an organism and actually make something new. Now, I, if you want to believe that, that's fine, but you're believing against the data. 
The data clearly show after billions and billions of mutation events, whether it's plants or fruit flies or whatever, that the mutation deteriorates the genome. It does not improve it. So you can believe what you want to believe, but if you're using the data as a guide, the data indicate that mutations are not good sources for, uh, for increasing the information and so forth of the organism. So in the end, I, I want you to understand uh, the characterization here is not to believe something that you want to believe. You need to believe what the data tell you. There are wonderful aspects of evolution that I would truly like to believe. The problem is the data don't allow me to because I don't see it either in genetics or in, uh, or in uh, chemistry or in physics. And so as a result, it's very hard for me to believe it when all the data that I see go against it. Uh, so whereas I would love to be able to trace my family tree all the way back to some primitive uh, single cell life form, there's a lot of, from a scientific point of view, that's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Scientists hate discontinuities. You know, we like nice, smooth, varying functions that we can take derivatives of and integrals of because those are things we can describe. If we can't, if, we, if something in nature doesn't uh, happen slowly and smoothly, we don't like it. But whether we like it or not isn't the reason to believe it. I don't like quantum mechanics. I hate it. But the data are very clear. Quantum mechanics works, at least on the atomic level. It makes some crazy claims, but it works. The data make it clear that right now, at least from what we understand of genetics and the fossil record and so forth, the creation model is the more adequate scientific explanation. We will end this portion of the debate uh, after, after Dr. Martin's five minute rebuttal to the rebuttal. Well, it's almost sleight of hand what, you, what you're hearing. Um, it's a wonderful way of twisting and extrapolating the evidence, which is um, uniformly and almost uh, entirely in favor of the evolutionary model and turning it into what sounds like something very reasonable. But in fact, just taking the fossil record, we have no contradictions in the fossil record, none whatsoever. We have ways of dating these sediments. Um, regardless what you've heard, the methods are very reliable. They have a little error margin with them. They always do. But if we have an estimate that says that the Earth is uh, 4.5 billion years old or certain fossils are 3.6 billion years old, and the, mar and the error margin is even a million years, that's kind of irrelevant to the overall picture. I, and, and I agree that there, are, there is a, um, uh, a range of, of creationist uh, 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 perspectives from those who are, uh, accept the young Earth model all the way to those who accept the Earth is, is billions of years old. But I chose the extreme position to explain the, uh, um, uh, the, the, our position relative to that one. But the technology is, is there for dating. We uh, have uh, sediments that are, are, are dated above and below hominid fossils that show that they're four million years or three million or two million years. And that's a continuity that you simply can't explain away. There are, uh, and even if we don't have every single uh, fossil that ever existed, it's impossible. But we do have earlier whale-like organisms that are more like terrestrial organisms. And then you go along in time. Again, the dates are consistent with this. And you find more amphibious ones. And then you find those that are aquatic. And then you find the diversification of modern ones. We have many, many, many examples like that in the fossil record of many different kinds of organisms. You can't explain that away as special creation. It just doesn't make sense. Where about um, uh, the idea that, again, these, these vestigial things, I want to again emphasize the evidence is that these are vestigial uh, structures. We do see this in the case of these whales. They're not just these, these reproductive supporting things. They're pieces of the limbs. I can show you this. 
Um, so I don't understand this, uh, that kind of a statement because I think Dr. Weil knows that I'm right on this. Um, and, and then this stuff, the, 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 I, I got a kick out of the, the discussion about uh, the feathers and about birds. Uh, Alan Fiducci is a friend of mine, and his friend who he works with, Larry Martin, is another good friend of mine. And I'm aware of their particular position on the, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, evolution of birds. It's not that they don't think that birds evolved or feathers evolved. Their position is that birds evolved from a common ancestor with dinosaurs, and that the feathered dinosaurs are not directly ancestral to modern birds. And in that, they're probably right, right? But that doesn't detract from all of evolution, or all of evolution of feathers, or all of evolution of birds. It's a way of subterfuge here. It's a way of using uh, smoke and mirrors to take away this beautiful evidence we have from the fossil record showing all of these transitional kinds of forms and saying that it didn't happen. And they propose no other better explanation for this. It, the, the, the fossil record does not support the creationist model. It supports absolutely the evolutionary model. And there are lots of intermediate fossils. And I can show you some. Uh, let me just show you this right here. Here's a, a reconstruction of a skull of a hominid from, northern, uh, from Eastern Africa, Homo ergaster, sometimes included in Homo erectus, about 1.8 million years. Now, it's not exactly the same as a modern human, but it certainly has some similarities, right? And there's lots and lots and lots of fossils like this. And how do you explain it otherwise than that it was some kind of connection? Here is the lower jaw uh, pair of a saber-toothed cat that I dug up myself from southern Kansas. It's dated about four million years. It existed there. Here's the areas where the huge canines from the skull came down and probably fit into pouches on either side of the mouth. We have lots of this stuff. I can show you many of these things that I collected in my own lab that we have dates on that are very, very reliable. So in, uh, in conclusion, because I'm basically running out of time here, uh, I just want to say that uh, along the same lines of what Dr. Weil said, the evidence uh, invariably supports not the creationist model, but the evolutionary model. Thank you. Okay, now we will move on to the questioning part of the debate. Sure, that's good. Okay, they will both sit down to answer. Um, we will, since Dr. Weil went first, we will uh, have Dr. Martin respond to the first question. The first question is, what is evolution's explanation for the Precambrian genetic explosion? Well, actually, I think probably the question meant for the Cambrian explosion, which occurred about 570 million years ago. And we see in the Burgess Shale, which I've mentioned to you, and some of these other deposits in uh, China, this uh, nice record of a variety of different kind of organisms that lived then, some of which are probably not ancestral to anything alive today and are probably their own phyla. They're so unusual. There's one creature from the Bur Burgess Shale, Opabinia, that has five eyes. I mean, there's nothing alive today that has five eyes. Um, but it didn't just start de novo there. In fact, there are records of metazoans, complex organisms, that go back further than that. The um, uh, Vendian, for example, was a period about 600 million years, uh, so before that. And we have some, um, uh, some very interesting creatures. And then even before that, there are, has been reported actually um, fossilized uh, embryos of some organism. We don't know what organism it was that started a little earlier than that. Um, one of the larger explanations for this, well, there's two of them. One is that most of these animals have soft bodies, and it's hard to find um, fossils of those sorts of things because they degrade so quickly. We were lucky in both cases because in the, in the Burgess Shale area, apparently an underwater reef simply collapsed on them and preserved them in this beautiful um, uh, uh, deposit, which you very rarely get in, in, in the fossil record. Um, uh, but one of the big explanations is that, of course, the levels of oxygen, you have to understand, were rising throughout the Precambrian period um, and probably didn't reach modern levels until maybe a billion years ago. 
Now, there is evidence before that, as I've mentioned to you, of, of um, prob probably uh, mats of cyanobacteria, uh, known as stromatolites, very common, which were starting to produce this oxygen. But modern oxygen levels probably didn't get higher until about that period. And then we see a, probably an explosion of life that occurred that was more uh, aerobic uh, in nature. I, I think the question was more, uh, what do you do with the Cambrian fossils? Because you know, in the geological column that I was taught as gospel truth when I was in college and uh, high school, was that the chordates didn't evolve until the Lower Devonian or Upper Silurian era, which is 140 million years supposedly later than the Cambrian rock. Yet we have chordates in Cambrian rock. Uh, so what I do is uh, with the Cambrian fossils is simply say this: when I see a geological column that shows the grand tail of invertebrates slowly evolving into chordates over periods of hundreds of millions of years, I can just say this textbook is hopelessly out of date because the Cambrian fossils tell us clearly that we had chordates in the uh, uh, Cambrian area, and therefore at least the lower four levels of the geological column that's shown in virtually every textbook, it's nothing short of a lie. Do I get to respond to that? All right, well, that, that's a very old set of textbooks that Dr. Weil is referring to. None of the modern ones show that. Um, and, and also, um, again, we have, and we do have chordates from these, these uh, deposits, but my explanation is basically the same, that the evolution of these groups, that means they must have started uh, earlier. And we just don't have a great record right now, and that's the way it is. But we do have other things. We don't, it's not just that animals appeared in the fossil record, wham, 570 million years ago. We have them at 600, we have them earlier, and we have simpler organisms going all the way back. That doesn't make sense if there was a special creation type of model going on. Can I respond to that? Yeah. <laughs> it actually does make sense in a special creation model because we view the layers of sediment, especially in a young earth creation model, depends on what flavor of creation we're talking about once again. In the young earth creation model, we view the layers of sediment as ecological zones. And the way we see the fossil progression is clearly from lower, uh, lower uh, marine environments all the way up to terrestrial environments in a very nice order that is exactly what you would expect from a global flood. So the progression of fossils is precisely what you would expect from a global deluge that uh, started from the fountains of the deep and worked its way up. OK, the next question is for Dr. Weil. The hallmark of a scientific theory is its ability to make predictions from given data. Would you explain more the prediction of intelligent design or creationism? Well, I think we're different now. Intelligent design and creationism are a bit different. Uh, let me give you an example of a young earth uh, prediction. Uh, in the early 1984, Dr. Russell Humphreys uh, noticed that all old earth versions of, uh, of uh, pla uh, paleo mag or, uh, uh, planetary magnetic fields were not workable. Uh, old Earth uh, uh, views of planetary magnetic fields, for example, predict that Mercury shouldn't have a magnetic field, but it does. Uh, the same models predict that Mars should have a magnetic field, planetary, but it doesn't. And so because of the uh, lack of ability for old Earth models to explain paleomagnetism, based on a young Earth creationist model, Dr. Humphreys developed a mathematical model that would predict the planetary magnetic fields of all the planets in the solar system. And he did this nine years before the planetary magnetic fields of uh, Neptune and Uranus were measured. However, when Voyager finally flew by those, it was exactly what was predicted by the young Earth creationist model. Interestingly enough, the old Earth model for Uranus was off by a factor of 100,000. Uh, so in the end, uh, uh, creationist models can make a lot of very useful predictions, as I showed you earlier, and as this uh, planetary magnetic field model shows. But I think the main thing is, it depends on the flavor of creationism because intelligent design would make quite different predictions since most intelligent designers are, are comfortable in an old earth framework. But one of, one of the um, uh, interesting discoveries of the 20th century was the fact that the earth's magnetic field flip-flops. For those of you who may not know this, that is if you had a, um, a compass in the past, it, at certain points in the past, it would have pointed south instead of, of north. And this has happened a number of times and uh, those flip-flops are now associated with certain sedimentary layers which have been dated and so we now know when the Earth's magnetic fields have flip-flopped. 
And this is a really interesting thing. And you can build up this mag mag magnetic polarity time scale as a result. And it turns out that uh, the magnetic polarity time scale and the fact of these flip-flops helped us to prove some, uh, a hypothesis which would seem so outrageous, but now we know it's true, and that is continental drift. We know now that the Earth is composed of these pieces called plates. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, only the plates don't fit together really well. Some of them go under each other, some go over, they move around, and when they go under each other and they move, the continents that are on them move also. And the reason that we discovered this was because of paleomagnetism. And that was simply um, because, let's see if I can get this. Okay. That, um, I'm sorry, I gotta come over <laughs> here. All right. When, uh, here's, here's the mid-Atlantic mid rift. This is an area where two plates are being, new plate materials being formed, and the plates are being pushed apart. And what we discovered when we took um, uh, what's called a magnetometer and ran it over here was that there were these patterns of paleomagnetism on either side of the rift valve there that exactly mirrored each other. So there would be a uh, flip-flop here, and there would be no, there would be normal, reverse, normal, reverse, normal, reverse. Not only did they mirror each other, not only did they mirror each other, but they were the same ages as you went out, and they got, guess what, older as you went out from it. And so this was the smoking gun that absolutely proved plate tectonics and also proved how old things were and explained why all the old um, uh, uh, coverage on the, of the earth, the crust, was mostly missing yeah, sure. because it had been subducted or, or driven under other plates and been eaten up. And there's this grand cycle that recycles this stuff to crust material. And so the continents have been moving around and it's very interesting and it explains lots of wonderful stuff. Like, for example, um, we now know that when you plot all of the earthquakes uh, that have occurred in uh, uh, that have been recorded, you find that like 99% of them are at plate boundaries. Wonderful stuff. The Mount Everest, we now understand, is the result of the Indian plate pushing up against the Southeast Asian plate. Right? So the explanation of why you get shells and stuff at higher elevations is now explained. Uh, the distributions of organisms on these continents, the modern distributions as well as the fossil distributions has to do with uh, this this uh, result of continental drift. We now un understand why we have cichlid fishes in South America and in Africa, for example, or marsupials in South America and in uh, Australia, because these areas were once connected and now they've moved apart. So there's a tremendous amount of explanatory power in this stuff, and paleomagnetism helped us a lot. Thank you. Uh, not really, except that once again, the uh, Earth or the young Earth the model of the planetary magnetic fields actually predicts rapid uh, magnetic field reversals on the order of uh, less than a year. And that prediction was made about seven years before rapid magnetic reversals in a column of lava were found. And currently, that's not understandable in the old Earth model, but it's quite understandable in the young Earth model. Okay, the next question is for Dr. Martin. Uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, I've been reading a lot uh, the scientific discoveries uh, of the, dis the scientific discoveries made. Uh, can you show how evolution explains our existence? And this person gives uh, an example. The pieces of a clock cannot become a clock unless a higher mind puts it together. Yeah. That's the... I can't answer the first question. It's a... Um... I think more philosophical than anything else. But in terms of the clock model or the watchmaker, I mean, um, this goes back a long, long way back to a theologist in the 1800s who likened um, uh, the world to, uh, uh, or, or organisms or humans to uh, a clock or a watch that has all these intricate parts in it. And we certainly are uh, fairly complex creatures, there's no question about that. But uh, again, this also talks about the intelligent design model, which Dr. Weil has mentioned also, which is kind of obsolete, but also this idea of irreducible uh, complexity, again. Uh, it all is another way of trying to explain intelligent, this, this um, uh, similarity due to in, in intelligent design, or, or the, the, the existence due to intelligent design. 
And, and of course, my um, response to that and explanation for that is that uh, these systems um, had precursors. They didn't come into being immediately, but we're aware of all of these ancestry descendant relationships. We do have mammals that go back in the fossil record, and then we have reptiles before them, and early tetrapods before them, and fish-like organisms before them. And each of those had systems that became different, not necessarily more complex, but different for different environments uh, as they became adapted. And that long trend of changes throughout the history of life, we're talking about uh, uh, millions and millions of years here, hundreds of millions of years, play out in terms of seeing these transitions in the fossil record. And they're there. They're very, very clear. I would tend to agree with what Dr. Martin, at least the first part of what he said. Uh, you can't answer the first question scientifically, what's, why are we here, and so forth. And I do agree that the statement, you know, a bunch of watch parts can't come together on their own is actually uh, uh, even not true prob probabilistically. You could have that happen under, under a long time period. But I think the, the, the nub of William Paley's uh, argument was essentially it, it makes sense when you see a lot of design to assume a designer. I mean, when we search for extraterrestrial life, what are we looking for? We're looking for signals that have design. Why? Because we don't expect radio signals to have design unless they were designed by an intelligent being. Same with archaeology. We look, when most of what we know from archaeology comes not from the bones of people, but from their tools that they left behind. Because we learn about the designer by looking at his or her design. Do you want Yes. Um, this is for Dr. Weil. We have found dinosaur fossils that have been dated billions of years old. How does this correspond with the creation view? Well, I don't think we found dinosaur fossils that are billions of years old, have we? <laughs> They're, billions? Yeah, it said billions. Oh, didn't you say, yeah. Uh, uh, 65, yeah, 60 to 100, depending on how you define dinosaur and so forth, you're talking about hundreds or tens of millions of years. Uh, I would, you know, as a young Earth creationist, I would say that those dating methods are very unreliable. I mean, when you can find soft tissue in these dinosaur bones that are supposedly uh, tens of millions of years old, it's hard to believe how they're really tens of millions of years old when you find soft elastic tissue in them. Uh, so I think that points, as a nuclear chemist, I can tell you the radioactive dating doesn't work. Uh, uh, so I don't say that they're uh, tens of millions of years old, although Dr. Martin will. Um, but I would say that the dinosaur fossils fit in a creation model as, you know, dinosaurs were very highly specialized to tropical or to, to certain conditions. And when the global flood occurred, the conditions of the climate changed significantly. And so a lot of dinosaurs went extinct because they couldn't adapt to the new conditions around. Okay, um, back to this idea about a design designer. Again, that's really in the eye of the beholder in terms of, and, and, it, and it's, a, again, this explanation of, I don't understand how it could have evolved, therefore it must have been designed. That does not follow. You understand that's not logical. All right. Uh, then as far as dating being unreliable, it is reliable. So you have two opinions. You can figure it out for yourself. Hit the, hit the literature, Google it, you'll find out. Um, and let's see, what else? Oh, this idea that, get back to the designer, but with regard to uh, hominid fossils um, and, and, their, and their tools, uh, well, sure, you can recognize something that has been worked by humans. That doesn't occur naturally, but that doesn't imply anything supernatural. It's just that it's been worked. We don't say anything other than that. And by the way, we do like to, Provide, to, to have the bones of the hominids that went along with them to basically have the association between those. And we have lots of them. Okay, we'll have one more question. And um, I'm sure if any of you would like to come down and ask a quick question afterwards, they, they may stay here a little longer. I don't know, you have to discuss that with them. But uh, <laughs> the next question is for just did that one. Next question is for Dr. Martin. How do you explain that 95% of the geological column contains fossilized clams in each strata? It might mean bivalves. I mean, that's the most common. 95% of the geologic column contains fossilized clams in each strata. 
Um, 95 cents. Is it, aren't well, it's, it's, uh, it would really take a, a long time to, to um, kind of talk about this, but we wouldn't gain very much from it. I mean, there are lots of fossil clams in strata, but not 95% of them, and, and some are, they, these are mostly marine circumstances, and it doesn't take into account terrestrial ones. So let, I think we should move on to another question. Mm -hmm. Can you explain, both of you, can you explain the irreducibly complex flagellum motor? <laughs> okay. Um, I prefer not to, but let's see. Um, do we want to take that one? Doesn't matter. I mean, I'll leave it up to you. I'm, I'm happy to move on and take the, You know this yeah, one plays, well that, yeah, plays to me, move, so let's, why don't you pull one? Let's find pull one that plays to him. I have more questions for Dr. Wild. Okay. That's all right. I can respond to them. Okay. Dr. Martin, what evidence or theories exist concerning evolution in our current human species? Have we stopped evolution of our physical bodies and moved on to mental development? Yeah, that's a fun that's a question. One. That's a great one. Right. Okay. This is a hard one to answer from the evolutionary perspective because one could argue that Darwinian evolution for humans has come to a screeching halt. Um, in part because we control our environment so completely. And, you know, we wear clothes, we divest our clothes depending upon the environment. Um, we uh, uh, can change the temperature in our houses, uh, medicine, et, et, et cetera. But um, probably there are some things that are maybe just beginning to become understood, like that are maybe having an effect, like. Um, the radiation environment of the planet. Maybe there's some selection going on there that we're not aware of and, and, and um, uh, certain fetuses that don't deal well with that are not being born and others that, that are. Um, but it's hard to imagine with the total um, integration in terms of um, reproduction between in different kinds of individuals um, um, how there would be any further directional selection for certain human characteristics. In order to have that, you'd have to have, let's say, all tall people mating just with tall people and that sort of thing. And I think you understand what I'm saying. So to my, from my perspective, I think the question is probably right, that we're heading into more an intellectual, kind of maybe a lot more bizarre than you think kind of era in the future, combining machine and organic things. We probably will, well, I don't know if you'll see, but probably within a couple hundred years, we'll probably see um, uh, artificial life and this kind of thing. It's going to be a really bizarre world uh, that the, only the science fiction people have really um, depicted even reasonably. Yeah, I, I agree a lot with what Dr. Martin is saying here, and I think this is a good point uh, of time to understand that even as a creationist, uh, I recognize that uh, within their genome, organisms can adapt quite a bit. And I think a great example of ha that happening in humans is wisdom teeth. Uh, wisdom teeth are a reaction to a change in diet, essentially. As we changed our diet, I think our jaw changed a little bit to accommodate the different diet. So in some ways, by changing our environment, we did do a little bit of uh, changing of ourselves as well. But I agree with Dr. Martin that I think a good fraction of what's going to happen in the future is going to deal with because we can uh, uh, change our own environment or alter our own environment to suit our own needs, our technology is going to be a part, become a part of our changing and adapting. So, you know, humans wearing exoskeletons and things like that, I can imagine because it's a part of this whole idea that rather than adapting to your environment, you're going to make your environment adapt to you. I'm so glad you brought up the wisdom teeth idea. Um, because this is such a wonderfully cl classic example of, of the evolution of the human skull. Right? Our, and our ancestors had no problem with wisdom teeth or the last molars and that sort of thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Our, our ancestors had no problem with their wisdom teeth or their 18-year molars or anything of like that. They had plenty of space in their jaw, in, in upper, upper palate, in part because their brains were so small. So what's happened is then there, there's been this proportional or allometric change throughout human evolution where we've gotten to be smart and have a big brain and a big cranium at the expense of our teeth, right? So you have all these problems in your teeth because the energy is going to, to in during your development to produce your nice big brain. So you'll just have to put up with that. 
I would disagree that it has to do with the bang going larger, but it, clear, it is clear that I think you know, human jaws have changed over time. Okay, we'll go ahead and conclude there. Uh, if you would, just give both of them a round of applause.